Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We are in a series entitled, It's Complicated. How do you say that in Spanish? Complicado. Está, oh, whatever. It's complicated. And uh, we started this a little bit a while ago, and we've been talking. It's a, relation, a series about relationships. And man, this morning's message um, really, really encourage you to pay attention and probably take some pictures. But if you got some notes, actually, if you follow us, want to follow us along, there's a QR code right there on the back of those seats. You can see some of the notes that are going to be in there. I think it's going to be beneficial to you today, tomorrow, and the future, okay? But the title of this morning's message or the topic is Parenting is Complicated. And everybody that can agree with that said... Good. I look at the Andersons over here. Man, I'm telling you, these are one of the finest people, families that I know who are doing it good, are doing it well, not doing it perfect, but they are a great example. So if you need help, call him, okay? (laughs) Sorry, Josh. (laughs) Little five-year-old Johnny was in the bathtub, and he was, his mom was taking him a bath. He does not like taking baths. And while he's in the bathroom, mom's washing his hair, and he notices the hair, you know, getting a little long. He goes, little Johnny, your hair is growing so fast. It looks like you're going to be needing a haircut here pretty soon. Little Johnny looks at mom and says, mama, I think you're just watering it too much. (laughs) I thought that was cute. In every family, you always have a child that is a very strong-willed child. Isn't that the truth? Anybody been there? Who was that strong-willed child? Just raise your hand. Yes, I know you were. I married one. I got you. Um, but don't, don't check out. In Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, you guys might have heard this passage of scripture before. It says that train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they shall not depart from it. I love how the Passion translates it. Uh, the Passion Bible does. It goes this. It goes, dedicate your child to God. I love that. I mean, it's like, here, God, you want them back? Here, you can have them. <laughs> and point them in the way that they should go. And the values that they have learned from you will be with them for life. Isn't that the truth? You want to know? You're acting just like your mother. You're acting just like your dad. They're following you for life. Some of the same things that you said you would never do, you find yourself doing. Why? Because sometimes we just adopt these things, not only in marriage, but in parenting as well. Natalie and I were 17, and she was 16 when she was found out that she was with child. Had no idea how it happened, but <laughs> she found out that she was pregnant. And uh, so I began immediately, I straightened up. I'm like, man, I, I got to figure this thing out real quick. So immediately I put my work hat on. I was like, I got to find all these jobs. I got to be this this dad, and I got to be this, I'm bringing a child into this world. And obviously at 17, I was like, man, I can do better than dad. You know, look what he's done, you know, right now. And I mean, little did I know, dad was doing amazing, but little did I know. Somehow or another, in those teenage years, the enemy comes in and tries to just put division and discourse uh, with the relationship that you should be having with your parents. And so we were there, and then next thing I know, 19, I mean, 19 months, nine months later, 19 months, I'd have been a big baby. <clears throat> uh, nine months later, you know, she starts getting these contractions and stuff. And so we call the hospital. It's like, hey, and we take her to the hospital. False alarm. She's not dilated any. I'm like, dilated? What the heck is a dilated? A dilated? I have no idea. We're kids. We don't know anything. I didn't know. So we did this a couple of times, false alarms all the time. And you just can't be coming over here every time there's a pain You've got to just wait until your water bust or whatever, all that stuff goes on. So I was like, man, babe, let's just go. Let me figure out this dilating thing. So let's go in dad's truck. And let's go for a ride. We go riding. I'll take her through bumps, and I'm hitting all these things. <laughs> let's figure this dilation thing out. Maybe something will happen, and she has to. So like, maybe the baby starts coming out. So here's a true story. I'm serious. And uh, next thing you know, her contraction started really, really getting difficult, where we had to go to the hospital. And long story short, here we were for the next 18 hours with this first child. And she was in major, major uh, pains and labor. And she still couldn't dilate, but only so much. And they wound up having a C-section for her. And I got a whole other message on all that. But it's, uh, it wound up being just very, di- very difficult. So I walked in to the area where the windows are at down here in Guadalupe. And I'm looking for my little girl. 
uh, Aaron Lachey Avalos was born on August. And I sat there, and the nurse is there. It's like, here she is, here she is. I'm like, no, it's not her. It's this one. It's this one. <laughs> she goes, no, it's this one. It's just fresh. It's like, it's, it's impossible. I was surprised. They're like, why? Because they were showing me a blonde hair and blue-eyed baby. I'm like, no, uh-uh. So this one looks like me. This one right here. He goes, no, this is the one. I'm like, okay. So I'm freaking out. It's like, she's not Mexican. <laughs> I'm producing after my own kind here. What's going on? Natalie's passed out. She's under anesthesia. And I finally go into the room later, and uh, she wakes up. And I mean, I give her a hug, and I felt horrible about all the stuff that was going on. And uh, she's like, did you see the baby? I was like, yeah, did you see the baby? <laughs> She said that she looked at me thinking, it's like I had this weird look. It's like I was mad or something. I was like, I, babe, she's not Mexican. She's blonde hair. What's going on here? And so we, we laugh about it. And just to, to let you guys know, my, my mom's mom, she was German. And she was a German twin, actually. And all that real light-complected, wet eye, all that came from that family. Different eyes and real cool. And to top it off, I found out later, my mom had been praying for a wet house. She was praying for a, a little girl <laughs> with blonde hair because her growing up, when she was born, she was, they called her the Prieta, which means dark, bla black. And her sister was a whole real light complected. And she always was envious of the comments that they would give to her sister and not to her. So she would pray for a little Edita, a little girl. Well, we got it. We found it. 30 years later, my brother, his kids were, you know, um, white and, not white, but they're, they're anyways, they're, they're light complected as well. And so we wound up being there for the next few days or so. It was beautiful. It was awesome, you know, figuring out how to burp her and feeding her and changing all the pampers and all that kind of stuff. Stayed in there like a little vacation resort. It was cool. But all things have to come to an end, <laughs> Right? The nurse comes up one day, and she goes, okay, Mr. Avalos, this is the day. I said, this is the day what? For what? He goes, this is the day you, you get to take your baby home and your spouse. I need you to drive around to the front entrance, and uh, we'll, we'll meet you there, and you can pick up and take your child at home. I'm like, no way. <laughs> so I go, and there they are for sure. They open up the door, and she says, where's the car seat? I was like, I don't have a car seat. It's like, I barely have enough gas for this car. What's so they gave us a car seat, put little Aaron in it. We just put her, there's no car seat belts or anything like that. We just put her in the middle of us and took off. And I'm sure that nurse had this look like, you have no idea what you're doing. And you know what? I had no idea what I was doing. So we went home and my little girl came and it was fun. Aaron Lachey, I was blonde hair. Do you have a picture of her? Is it there? Anyways, it should be there somewhere. There she is. Here's my little girl. We have other ones that were, we could really see her blonde hair. This is the, it's the little one. That's the little one over there. There she is. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing moment. Dad opened up the door to us, and we got to take her home. I changed the diapers because Natalie would throw up. She, couldn't, she just didn't like that. I wound up feeding her in the middle of the night because Natalie was passing out. And I would have to flip her over to try to put the baby, you know, in her area, the area where we get feed. And finally, we were like, babe, you just, you just put some stuff in a bottle. It's like, it's easier for to do that. So we wound up, you know, doing all that stuff for a little while, learned how to burp her, learned how to hold her, and what have you. But in the middle of all this experience, in those first few weeks and months, I had this question that's, that was going on constantly. And actually, for the first several years, I had it going on. It's probably something that you're familiar with. You probably asked it in some way or form. But the question was this. Man, are we doing this right? Are we doing this right? It's like nobody gave us instructions. Nobody, it's like, what the heck is happening here? You start burping. It's like, oh, my gosh. Well, all we had was all these Mexican folklore things. Put this little red thread on there. Don't look at her. Don't, you know, touch her, touch her, touch her. Don't give her a whole, all, all these crazy things. But are we doing this right? We're wondering. And so we wound up, uh, and here's what I know about you guys. Same thing. You guys went through that same thing. Usually it's the first 12, 11 years or so, and they go through different seasons. They change clothes. They get out from diapers. They have their little clothes. They change shoes. You're taking them into first grade. The terrible twos, it's crazy. It's going wild out there. You read books. You try the best that you can. Your kids tell you that you're doing it wrong. 
because their parent, you know, their friends' parents are doing it this way, and we're doing it this way, and so you're kind of confused, or at least we were a little bit confused in the in the beginning. So that's how I wanted to begin this message this morning with that whole idea: Are you doing it right? Did you do it right? And the follow-up question is kind of like that: What exactly is it? What exactly is that when it comes to parenting? What exactly is the win as a parent? you got to find out what that win is. Is it just safety? Is it obedience? Is it to make them better citizens? Is it I want them to be making some money, NFL, and, you know, Major League Baseball? What is that? What is the win? What's the direction that you're pointing your children as you parent them? And the reason I ask this is because if you can't answer that question, you're going to find out later on in life that you've been going possibly in the wrong direction as a parent. And here's why I know that is because of this, because direction always determines destination. Direction always determines destination. If I am going west on 10, it will help me get to the destination called San Antonio. There is no possible way that if I go west, it's going to take me to Houston to see the Astros win tonight. Okay? or the Rangers, whatever. They're both from Texas. Direction always determines, and if you don't choose it, if you don't choose a path, it's going to choose you. That's good. How you parent, how they respond to authority, how you approach discipline, how they honor others. Man, parenting is complicated. It's crazy out there in this world called parenting, isn't it? And we can't afford to parent by reacting to irritations that will come along the way. We have got to lead as a parent to a destination. So the question is, what is your destination? Now, just to be clear, Natalie and I didn't have one. I mean, I think our goal was, let's just keep them alive, <laughs> right? It's a good start. It's the one thing that I find the most difficult. It's the one thing that I regret the most as a parent because we didn't have any of this. I didn't have the books that we have now, the resources that we have now. I think the book that was real strong at that time was um, Dobson's book, Dare to Discipline. And so, man, I locked into discipline and that's all we had was discipline, 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 discipline. And after that, more discipline, more discipline, more discipline. Well, but what's the end goal? Now, just to uh, help you understand, all my girls, I got three girls, and I have a grandson that I raised. All of my girls have received Christ. I've got to baptize all of my girls through water baptism. All of them are doing well. God gave me a vision for every single one of those girls, not to force them into this direction, but so that I could pray for them as they were taking different courses and pray that God would get a hold of them and, and do what he does always, is take care of his kids. All of them are doing well. They all helped us start this church, all of them. And as far as I know, I mean, our, our youngest daughter was here earlier in the other service. All of them still like us. <laughs> all of them still like each other. All of them still connect with each other as siblings, and, and everything's good. So I must have done something right. But this whole parenting thing, it's the one thing that has hung over my head for years. Um, it's hurt my heart so many times. Why? Because I just blew it so, so, so often. I could have prevented a whole lot of um, wounds in my children, in my spouse, in myself, if I would have just simply had and pointed a, a certain direction, a certain, a certain win for my household. The shame was so heavy that it just carried throughout the whole ministry up until just honestly just a few weeks ago when I was in Alaska. All of a sudden, I was so thankful for that moment and that experience that God showed me. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But early on at Crossroads, uh, when we started the ministry, we sat down and we developed what we call core values. And at first we had like 10 of them or so, and then we wound up just having three and the three that we have adopted right now. And I want to encourage you, um, you don't have to use this exact one, but some kind of a form of it. 
I want to use one of those. If I was to do this all over again, I would make this our it. I would make this the destination as we parent our children in every stage that they're going through. It's this, relationships rule. Relationships rule. <clears throat> in other words, what's the picture that I wanted to see after they're grown and after they're gone? When they no longer have to be in my house, they no longer have to be for any reason, but they choose to be, what's the one thing, what does that look like? And I, and I look back and I was like, man, I have to parent them with the relationship staying and remaining intact. Do you understand what I'm saying? Their future. That when they're grown and they're gone and they're doing their own thing, do they still love dad and mom? And they still love us. They still give mom a hard time. They still love the Lord. And they still connect with each other. And so that's, that's the goal. As a matter of fact, in Mark's Gospel, the 12 chapters, I thought about this message. Uh, I was reminded of this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Love dad. Love that parent. Here's the goal, to love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the first commandment. And then the second one is like it, that you love your neighbor, that you love others, that you love your enemies even. He goes, these things, uh, this command, there's no other commandment greater than these. It's about keeping the relationship in task is what I would encourage you to, if you haven't formed that yet, Create something with that relationship in mind. Not obedience, not them needing you, not you being right as a parent. As a matter of fact, the goal shouldn't even be um, that they should have some kind of a Bible doctrine or a certain belief system. They should have such a strong amount of faith. It's like, oh my gosh, pastor. Why? Because in our lives as pastors, as ministers, this is what we so, so too often see. We see parents' faith is the one thing that always gets in the way of the relationship with their children. It's the wrong version of their faith that gets in the way with the relationship with their children. We've all seen parents that parent with, well, Jesus said, Jesus said this, the Bible says this, you need to do it this because the Bible says, well, the Bible also says to stone your children if they're disobedient, but you don't shoot, tell them that right? It's not just about their belief system. Um, you know, we've seen individuals who are very, very Bible heavy, but love light. And you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that guy. And it has to be more than um, the Bible says. I thought my goal was just going to, let me just be the best follower of Jesus and everything's going to be okay. And it's just not, it's just not. It's a whole lot more than that. Listen, when you think about the life of Jesus and you look at the scriptures, Jesus never allowed what people believed or didn't believe to keep them from having a relationship with him. Good. Never. He didn't do that. It wasn't about their belief system. He always opened the door of communication. He always left the relationship open. As a matter of fact, people that never liked Jesus still liked him because of who he was and how he was representing himself. They didn't like the religious leaders of that day and the religious folks that weren't living that way. Does that make sense? Is your child a prodigal? Well, how did our heavenly father uh, communicate in those moments when his prodigal child was acting up? Well, Jesus tells us a story of how our heavenly father treated them. He treated them by op opening and welcoming with, with a man, I mean, just op with open arms. And so I found out, looking back, it's like, man, if I want to succeed as a parent, I'm going to have to do that in some form or shape. I love Andrew St uh, Andy, uh, Andy Stanley's quote. He's one of my favorite authors, and he's one of my, actually, he's a mentor of mine. Uh, but he said a quote, he quotes something like this about relationships with parents and kids. He says, if you're a Christian and your faith is getting in the way of your relationship with your children, you may have subscribed to the wrong version of your faith. And the wrong version of faith is the exact opposite of what you see in the book of Acts and the first century Christians. The first century Christians, it says that they turned the world upside down, not because of their creed, but because of their love. They didn't follow Jesus' belief system. They followed Jesus' behavior. They didn't have a doctrine. 
They didn't have a Bible. It was being written as they were following that one command that he says, you love one another as I have loved you. You show them that same type of love. You keep that door open. Do you understand that? They follow that. Jesus loved us before we ever believed anything. So it's not just about a belief system. Relational Jesus is a whole lot more effective than a form of religious Jesus. And so what is that in your life? What version are your children seeing in your house? It's a great question to ask. What version have your children been raised up in? Now, I understand in this room, there are individuals who are right here in the beginning stages where they are having kids in these formative years. And that is my target. But I also understand there are people who've already raised their kids and they're now grandparents and what have you, but you could still learn and from some of these things that I'm going to share this morning because we still have opportunities to coach others. That's right. Amen. And there are some of us who have never been a parent. We've just been a child, and I think that it will help you also understand, it's like, oh, man, man, mom and dad did a great job in this area. Man, they sucked here. <laughs> and some of the wounds might come out and just might prick you a little bit, but that's okay. There's a reason for that. For such a time as this, there's a reason why you're in this room. So I thought that the best way for me to approach this message, I was like, man, Lord, I was tormented because one, the, the shame and the heart, uh, the hurt that I've had in this, in this topic. But two, I was like, man, we have such a broad demographic. How do I approach it? What's the best way I can be helpful? And so I figured that the best way to share with you this morning uh, some truth is to take a 30,000 foot view and kind of give you a broad idea of the different stages that you will find yourself as a parent and the different stages that you will find your children in. And with that, because, because whenever you understand that, oh, I'm in this stage now, and this is this focus, and that my child is in this stage now, you will have an advantage. And so I'm going to take a 30,000 foot view because parenting is like the law of the farm. You can't short circuit the process. And there are four seasons as a parent that you have to sow. There are sowing seasons. And sometimes we forget what season we're in because we're so emotionally in that moment and angry at our spouse or whatever's happening. We just take matters in our own hands. But if you create a, a, a win, you create a, a, what do you call it, like a, just a path that you want to go to, it can just, you can just stop and it's like, okay, take a deep breath and let me approach it this way. It'll help us. So in a big picture, what are the four seasons? Here are the four stages of parenting. You got zero to five, the discipline years. Anybody remember those? I was grounded all my life. <laughs> the training years, five to 12. Elementary years, what have you. Coaching years, 12 to 18, and that's the most difficult time for me, for us anyways. And here's the reason why. Well, anyways, the friendship years, that's 18 plus or more. You know, some of them are in college, and we get, they still are around and stuff. But those are the four stages that you, that's the framework that you want to use. Now, these, in, these aren't things that we knew or understood back then. I mean, we didn't have no framework. I literally, it was just like, man, let's just keep these ki kids alive. Let's get them some food. <clears throat> and children will automatically, they understand this automatically, they automatically move from one stage to the next. Parents are the ones that get stuck. I'm the one that got stuck. Because in the beginning, in these discipline years, man, they had no pushback. It's like, oh, man, these are awesome kids. They're beating kids. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't used to it in these this years. So I would revert back to the discipline and compliance year as, as parenting skills. And man, so much damage, so many wounds were unnecessary if I would have just understood the big picture of the seasons of what I should be sowing into my children's lives. So I'm going to break it down just a little bit. The discipline years, zero to five. Let's take a look at that. In this particular season, um, that's when you teach them that there are consequences to their actions, okay? Um, the strength 
you strengthen your child's obedience muscle through multiple reps and appropriate consequences. Hey, there's a reason why we do these things. No, yes, and there's consequences. You don't just focus on the negative consequences. There's also rewards also, you know, that you want to uh, value and you want to highlight. Why? Because if you reward great obedience, good obedience, it'll get repeated in their life. And so that's the season where you discipline them. Natalie and I... um, we didn't have, like I said, at that time, we had this book that was kind of our guide, and we were disciplining about everything. And by the way, at the two-year-old age, it gets crazy. Some of the kids are crazy at two years old. But don't bring your children to pastor and say, this child has a demon. <laughs> okay? I've had that before. I was like, you don't have a demon. You have a demon. <laughs> It's, it's the season, you know, I told Natalie I was going to share this. She goes, you can't share that. It's like, no, seriously, babe. It's the season that men begin to contemplate having a vasectomy because like, man, I ain't doing that again. I'm not going to produce that sucker again. They will go through the pain of that because they don't know what the heck is happening here. And so, but that's the season where you're disciplining your children. Natalie, we didn't, we, we were just, we, I had a heavy hand constantly. All we had was discipline for this. this. I felt like all I was doing was spanking all the time. Poor little kids. Man, if they had CPS, I would have been in jail. (laughs) I'm serious. It's like, that's how I was raised up. And so uh, we had to settle on it. It's like, hey, what are some, what are some parameters? What are some of the things that we have to take immediate action on? We can't, we can't spank them for spilling Kool-Aid. We can't spank them for looking at me with an attitude. I can't, you know, all these things we had to figure out because everything was a spanking all day, every day. And so we decided that disobedience, disrespect, and dishonesty were the three things that we had to take immediate action and be consistent with raising our kids. You can adopt your own Ds. You can make Bs or Ss or whatever, but you got to figure it out. It can't be a laundry list. But you got to figure out what values. And I would encourage you to look at character more than anything else. Okay, disobedience, disrespect, they can't, can't do that. And so we would immediately take care of that. And again, remember that what's repeated is rewarded. That's a discipline years. The next season or sowing season is the training years, 5 to 12. In this season, you train while you explain. In other words, you are going to give them the why behind the rules and expectations. They need to know that because the skills that you want them to produce in public have to be trained in private. And so we would do this. We would train our kids. We would train them how to have manners, what's appropriate manners. Natty would train them on how to set the table. We would train them on shaking a firm handshake and looking at people in the eye. We would train them on uh, raising your voice so that you, you can speak clearly and loudly so that they can hear you. There's a lot of things. We train them on appropriate ways to interrupt while we were having conversations with people. It's like, dad, 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 dad. It's like, shut up, kid. And I go, hey, stop. Well, we have to like, okay, we can't do that publicly, so we got to figure it out. <laughs> right? Say, when I'm having a conversation and you need dad, just stand by me. Yeah. When you stand by me, I will see you, and then when the doors open, I will make sure and address Okay, dad, okay, dad. Dad, dad, dad. I got to go potty. It's like, oh, shoot. I got to go see y'all. Because I'm the one that changed the diapers. <clears throat> you imagine? Anyways, so we tra- you got to train. You and I cannot expect them to act publicly what we've never trained them to do privately. And so you got to figure that out. What, how do we train them? You practice it. What do you do if your child starts running? What are you going to do if your little sister starts running out in the street? I'm going to yell or whatever. I don't know, whatever that is. Natalie had kind of more phobia than I did. So, you know, she talked about the fears a lot. And, but either way, you got to train. That's the training season, 5 to 12 years old. And then you got the coaching season. This is now, this is the time, the coaching season, where the kids are like 13 12 to 18 years old. In this season, they might have a demon and they might be possessed <laughs> in that season. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but this is a season that you connect more than you correct. 
I was horrible in this season. But this is the season that um, you loosen the tight reins of those training years and move to the sidelines and begin to coach. You're not out of the game. You're still in the game. But you're in the game to coach them, to help them, to redirect them. I used to coach for baseball, so I, I understand this concept. And you, you sit there on the sidelines and you watch how they respond in situations. And then you just begin to coach them and have conversations in their lives. And that's the goal, is you're trying to keep them uh, to, to come back constantly in that season of their life for guidance and support. Because that's the season where Things go crazy. Dad doesn't know nothing. Mom doesn't know nothing. Nobody knows nothing. I know what I'm doing. But they don't. I mean, hormones are taking place. Privacy. I want independence. This is the season that I was most hurt at because, Dad, you don't have to come to lunch anymore to the, to the schools. They're like, what do you mean? I've been coming to lunch all the time. I'm going to your high school, and I'm going to have lunch with you. In Jesus' name. <laughs> But I got stuck because I was not ready for the pushback. And really all the pushback was was the tension that they wanted to sit down and talk about stuff. And I didn't give them that. I wanted to just to comply and obey because dad said. And like I said, every one of my girls have gone through counseling because of that. And I hate that. I, I am just, it's not good. And I want to prevent that from taking place in your life. Here's the one thing that I don't hear a bunch of pastors talk about, but you have to understand also, remember, you have the spirit of the living God inside of you to lead you and guide you. There's great books. There's fantastic stuff out there. I can give you some resources. If you have some that have helped you, call the office or give it to Kim because we want to just put those things together. But remember, you have the spirit of God. They, they were there when that child came out of that womb. They know exactly the intricacies of that child in their brain and how they think. And so we always are putting him in the middle of it and saying, God, show me. Help me to understand. I don't get this. I don't understand why they're acting this way. Can you just show me? I remember walking or driving off of one, a 35 one day, and the spirit of God said, Amber's smoking cigarettes. I'm like, What? And I had no evidence, I had no clue that she had been smoking or whatever. So I'm going home thinking, how do I address this? How do I do this? I have no evidence. I can't accuse her. But the Spirit of God showed me that. And so I walk in and it's Amber's, it's like, hey, Amber, hey, Dad, how are you doing? It's like, I'm good. It's like, hey, and she's walking to her room. It's like, do you have anything you want to talk to me about? She goes, no, I'm good. And it's like, okay. Five minutes later, she walks back. She goes, actually, I do. She goes, I started smoking. And we got to have a conversation about that. It was so awesome. I don't think she stopped smoking, but we had a conversation. <laughs> if she did, I didn't know about it. A lot of stuff takes place in that um, season. Here's the one thing they didn't like, and I didn't know how to explain it, and I still don't. But sometimes I just knew in my spirit that they shouldn't be involved in certain things. And I'd tell them, hey, I don't, I don't think that's wise to do this. Why, why, I wanna know why. It's like, man, I can't even explain to you why. I just need you to trust me as your dad. It's like, no, that's stupid, that's not good. I, I, need, I didn't know why, why this is happening. You've been showing me why all this time. Now you can't even say that. It's like, that's true, I can't. It says, but sometimes you just gotta trust your parents and your dad for no reason. And I didn't do that very often. And I never said, well, God said. <laughs> it's the worst thing you can do. And, but that was just a difficult time. So if I could give you some advice in that season, not that I'm an expert, but here's the three things I would encourage you to do. Have a bunch of conversations. Cultivate conversations over and over and over again. And you will know if their heart is not open to you, that's an invitation to figure that out. You can't allow their heart to stay closed and remain closed and not, Lord, man, you got to help me because I don't, there, our heart, his heart is never closed to us. Our hearts should never be closed to him. He always has an open door. 
We always have to keep that door open. Somehow or another, we've got to figure it out. And usually, it's because of something we did or didn't do or said most of the time. The power and the weight of a man, of a dad's words, is heavier than anything on the face of this earth. How you say it and what you say it is so critical, especially in this season of their life. And so I would encourage you to also let them fail. Let them bust their butt and fail in this season. If you want your child to fail, you want them to fail when they're at home and you can talk about it, have conversations about it. You don't want them to fail when they're gone and they make these crazy decisions. They're gone already. You want them to fail in that. And I'm not talking about crazy failure. I'm just talking about let them fail in these seasons. I think it's important. And then once you make it through there, you're still alive. Everything's good. Then you go through the friendship years, which is an amazing, amazing time. If you've done the homework and all the sweat equity has taken place on the front end, that's when you can engage as adults and just enjoy each other's company. That's when you can, you're always a parent, you know that, but if they're gonna ask you for the input, let them initiate that input. We are still parents, we're always gonna be there, but it comes on their terms, not yours anymore. And I love it as a, as a, as a, as a man, as a, as a husband, as a dad. I, it's, nothing's more gratifying to me than my girls are still connecting with each other, and I don't know about it, but I hear about it. Like, oh, man, sisters are getting together. There's nothing more gratifying than I get a phone call, and it's one of my girls saying, hey, Dad, I mean, I, I need some advice on something. It's like, cool. It's like, let me get back in that seat again. There's nothing more gratifying that the kids want to come over. Actually, even tonight, they're like, hey, Dad, what are you going to do tonight? It's like, man, I was thinking about going to the Astros game. And she goes, why don't you just come over, and let's just hang out, and I'll get some wings. I'm like, that sounds good, too. And so there's nothing more gratifying that they just want to connect with you because they love you because you are their dad. And I thought I had blown it. I thought I would never experience that for years until I found myself in Alaska just a few weeks ago. That thing carried heavy on my heart for a long time. As I sat there, because somebody sent us as pastors to a little pastor's retreat, just three or four guys. They said, hey, Marcus, I'm gonna send you to this retreat. It's like, man, I don't need any more friends. And so he goes, no, it's a, it's a small group, a couple of guys, two, three pastors, just getting away to go rest and relax and refresh. It's like, okay, I went. The third day in, they uh, sat around. There was no ministry. We just went fishing. We caught 250 pounds of, I don't even know what kind of fish, all kinds of fish. But on the third day, we sat around a fire outside in Alaska, and they had given us some, three, some envelopes with encouraging words. Supposedly, they were supposed to be from people back um, in the congregation of these pastors and they were supposed to honor their pastors and encourage them and build them up and strengthen them. And so everyone read their notes, including myself, not out loud, just privately. But the, the, the question was, hey, how did you feel when you read these notes? I mean, all the pastors, they were all tearing up because they got notes from their parishioners that encouraged them and, and you know, kind of just restored some things. They just, there was a lot of scenarios going on. And when I opened up my notes, I was surprised. I was wondering, like, what members of the church are going to be sending me stuff? Who knows? And what are they going to say? And I wound up looking at it, and there was no one from the church. The letters that I got were all from the people that I thought I had blown it with. They were from my wife. They were from my kids. And they were from my grandson. And, man, they were so powerful. And they said, so what do you, they, they saw me tearing up like this. They're like, dude, what's going on? It's like, you know what? All these years, I've always said, if I want to be famous, I want to be famous in the house. I don't want to be famous anywhere else but in my home. I want to be able to look at my life and look back. And my girls would still just be able to talk to me and be there. And I thought I would never see that until I read these notes. And man, I said, my heart is full, (laughs) excuse me. And I realized that I didn't blow it. I realized that me being a follower of Christ and trying to do the best I could to follow Jesus, to love Jesus and to love others was enough because love always wins. 
Relationships always should rule. Was it perfect? No. Damage was done. Wounds were done. But in the middle of all that, the Spirit of God healed, restored, and we move forward. Amen. And so as I close this, I thought about how do I share this with you guys? What's the application for this? And here's the application. You can take this home. If you're here this morning, can you put the application on there? <clears throat> Maybe you're a child that's been hurt by a failing parent. Uh, the path to forgiveness is absolutely necessary. Pastor Joel, in the second uh, lesson on this particular series, has a great topic on forgiveness. Maybe you're here feeling shamed as a parent because, man, you just messed up and you feel horrible about it like I was. Well, you have to learn how to possibly forgive others and forgive them, but you got to forgive yourself also because you're worth it. Our Heavenly Father thought you were worth forgiving. You've got to see yourself that way as well. Start fresh. You still have opportunities. If you are still breathing and you still have kids, you still have an opportunity to make up those moments. Amen. And if you're here as a young family, let me encourage you. This is very, very important that somehow or another this week you get with your husband and your spouse and you find out what the path is for parenting. Destination or direction always determines destination. And it's so necessary to do that. Why? Because your kids are worth it. That's why. When um, I go through hard times, I always look back at that moment. I don't know if you guys remember your moment, but I look back when I got my little girl, all my girls, in one hand, and I was just looking at them. And this happened with every single one of the girls. I sat there, and I had this thought, and I looked at them, and I said, man, I will do anything for you. I will protect you. I'll fight for you. I'll watch. I will love you with everything. I'll die for you if I need to. And I need to go back often just to remind myself of that, especially times when I don't like certain things that are happening. It's like, man, this is what really matters right here. As I thought about that image, I thought about our Heavenly Father, and that's exactly how he sees you. He looks at you with those eyes and with the same just heartbeat. I will fight for you. I love you unconditionally. I'll do anything for you. I'll even die for you. And he's proven himself faithful. And he did it through his son. Why? So we can keep this relationship intact always. Because relationships matter. Amen. Love always wins. So Father, we are so thankful for this family. And I just speak your love and your encouragement. I thank you for your forgiveness, the power of your grace that works in moments like this one. We don't get it right, but man, God, I thank you that you're still with us. Lord, I pray that you would help us here, Lord God, become stronger families so that we could be a light to this community in the surrounding area. Um, give us tools. Let your spirit speak to us so that we can establish uh, your way, Lord God, your path. We can keep our relationships intact. And those kids that are out there, Father God, that have been hurt and wounded, by the stupidity of stuff that's happened, I pray that you would just minister your love and your grace upon that wound and heal them whole. So we just commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. We love you guys. You guys have a great week. Next week, we have a guy named, um, he's the former singer for the Newsboys, John James coming. So you don't want to miss it next week. And men, get ready. Please sign up, gentlemen. If you um, need finances, just register. We got you. We got you covered, all right? God bless. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>